we hope and pray that you are blessed by the Word of God as it's preached. Father God, we thank you for the chance to gather together to worship you, to extol your name, to praise you for your wonderful deeds. I pray, Lord, as we open your word this morning, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that are open to being transformed by your word. Please be with me, Lord, as I speak from your word. May what I say be true. May it do justice to what you have given us in your revelation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the year was 1986, and the place was the Sea of Galilee. You're not used to hearing about the Sea of Galilee in the 1980s. That's right, 1986, not AD 86. Well, at this time, the region was undergoing a massive drought. It actually had been in a drought for three years. And this was a major problem because the Sea of Galilee is the primary fresh water source for that region. And still to this day, a lot of their commerce is supported by fishing and things that go on in and around the Sea of Galilee, or as they call it today, the Lake Knesseret. So a lot of people were worried. Fishermen were worried. The people were worried. But the archaeologists, ooh, they were not worried because... As you can imagine, the Sea of Galilee around it is so much history from Roman era, from the time of Christ, and even before that. And so what this drought was doing was it was making the shore recede. And that meant they kept finding all of these discoveries, things that had been covered up for hundreds of years. In fact, during this time in the 1980s, during this drought, they had uncovered 15 ports from the Roman era, so from around the time of Christ that had been covered up. They had no idea they were there. Um, and they were kept finding new stuff all the time. And there was these two brothers, and their names were Yuval and Moshe Lufin, and they lived in their father's house right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And they sort of fancied themselves amateur archaeologists. And so they were super excited. All this stuff was happening. There was new discoveries being made. And so they'd go out there each day, and they'd go and see if they could find something notable and historic. And so it was one evening, it was actually the middle of the night, both of them were awoken by the sound of a truck outside of their window. There was a military truck that had been driving along the edge of the Sea of Galilee and had been stuck in the soft earth. And so they heard it revving the engine, spinning the wheels, they heard the soldiers cursing as they're trying to push it out of the mud so they could get home. And Yuval and Moshi could not go back to sleep that night because they figured with all that commotion and with the wheels spinning and all that stuff going on, maybe, just maybe, they turned up something interesting under the ground. And sure enough, the next morning, they dash out the door at first light and they go running to the spot where the truck was. And Yuval spots it first. He sees a little gleam of something metallic from the early morning sun. And so Moshe's running to catch up, and they're racing and racing, and they finally get there right to the spot where the truck was, and they find a coin, an ancient coin. It was actually, uh, the Department of Antiquities calls it a widow's mite coin. It has a little picture of an anchor on the back of it, and it's named that because of the story of the widow's mite from Scripture. It's the same sort of coin. And so this by itself was not a massive discovery. They would find these all the time, um, you know, almost like arrowheads. But they knew that where there was coins, there was perhaps something else that was holding the coins. And so they started digging. They found more and more of these coins, more and more. Before they knew it, they had dug a hole that was 26 and a half feet long by seven and a half feet wide. And at the bottom of this hole, there was this long wood beam which turned out to be the, the, the strake, is what it's called. It was the bottom of an ancient fishing vessel used on the Sea of Galilee. This type of fishing vessel was large enough that it would have hold, held about 15 passengers. It had a deck on the front and the back. It would have had this elevated helmsman platform. 
And it was the type of boat that four people could row or it could sail. It was exactly the type of boat that most likely the disciples and Jesus rode around on, on the Sea of Galilee. All the different stories we have in Scripture of them being fishing there or, or Jesus walking on the water or the, the story we're going to look at today about Jesus calming the storm. This is the same type of boat. And so it was a really neat discovery because it was in, I mean, it was pretty decayed, but they had the bottom of it. They got a really sense of the size of one of these boats. And the reason I tell you this is because it's interesting. But it's more than just interesting. I think there's, there's almost a lesson. It's almost illustrative for us about the passage we're going to look at today. Because this drought that was happening there was a time of great trial for the people in that region. But it was the trial itself that revealed something very precious about their history. And that's what we're going to see here as we look at Mark chapter 4, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. Is that very often, God uses the trials in our lives to reveal treasures. Something more precious than the pain that we go through to get it. So turn to Mark chapter 4, right at the end of it, uh, verses 35 through 41. Mark 4, 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with a great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Mark's gospel divides quite neatly. The first 10 chapters of it talk about Jesus' ministry around Galilee And it's in the latter half, chapters 11 through 16, that talk about his ministry in Jerusalem. And in the first 10 chapters, if you were to read through this book, it's all about demonstrating Christ's power and authority. You have 19 miracles in total that are recorded in the book of Mark. 16 of them happen in the first eight chapters. All of this beginning of this book is all about showing Jesus is God. He has the power over the elements, as we'll look at today. He has power over demons, if you kept reading in chapter 5. He has power over sickness. He he heals uh, Peter's wife's mother in chapter 1. He cleansed leper in chapter 1 as well. He healed paralytics in chapters 2 and the man with the withered hand in chapter 3. And even if you were to continue reading to the end of chapter 5, he demonstrates that Jesus had power even over death itself when he raised someone from the dead. Jesus is God. He is powerful. He has all power, all authority. And so one thing, as we read this passage together, one thing that we should observe is that this is a passage about Jesus' identity as God, as demonstrated through his power and authority. But I think there's also in this story a lesson about the disciples and a lesson about how we should see ourselves in the disciples and how God uses trials and how he grows our faith. Specifically, I think this is a passage about the disciples' faith in the midst of a trial. And there's so much we can learn from that. So what we're going to see today is believers can stand firm in our faith, not fearing, even in life's fiercest trials, if we remember these three truths. And this is going to form our outline. I'll tell you the three truths, and then we'll go through them one by one, okay? So the first one is we need to remember that Christ controls the timing of your trials. Christ controls the timing 
of your trials. We'll see this in verses 35 and 36. Second, we need to remember that Christ cares for you in the midst of your trials. We see that in 37 and 38. And finally, number three, remember that Christ conducts you through your trials, 39 through 41. So let's look at that first one. Remember that Christ controls the timing of your trials. Look again there at the first two verses, 35 and 36. It says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. A couple of observations. What's the context here? It says, on that day. Well, this had been a very long day in a series of very long days. If you look back in verse 1 of chapter 4, you see that he had been teaching beside the sea. It says in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4, again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him. So he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching, he said to them, and then it goes on and starts telling his teaching. So it's a long day of teaching. But you, you get the scene. He had built, they, they'd set up sort of like a floating pulpit. All the people were along the sea, and they put Jesus out in the boat so he could speak to all of them. And I've, I've petitioned the elders here again and again to let me put buoys on this and bring the baptismal up here so we can try it. No dice. But that's the scene. And this is the end of that day, okay? Chapter 4, these verses we're looking at is the end of this day of him teaching all day by the sea. Then there's this decision you see that are made, made here. He says, let us go across to the other side. So this is Jesus' decision. He says, let us go across to the other side, and they leave the crowd. So where was he going? Well, he was leaving the western side of the Sea of Galilee to go over to the eastern side. The final destination you'll see is the Gerizines in chapter 5. You remember the story of the Gerizine demoniac, the guy who was uh, possessed by all of those demons, Legion, and he cast them out into the pigs? That's where they're headed. That's the next story in our chronological order. Just giving you some context. And then there's a couple of strange phrases that I just want to point these out. They say they took him with them in the boat just as he was. What does that mean? I think it's actually quite simple. They just mean he didn't go back onto the shore. He was in the boat preaching, and they said, just as he was, they just took off. But then this other thing is, is, is easy to miss, and other boats were with him. If you know this story, if you've heard this, do you remember that there were other boats there? I remember when I was first studying this, I was like, what other boats? <laughs> what is this? Um, and actually, you know, in the parallel accounts of this in the other Gospels, it doesn't mention the other boats. So who are these other boats? I don't think it's some big mystery. We're not told anymore about them. They don't get mentioned again. Some people speculate, oh, maybe they sunk. It's like, well, that's kind of macabre. It doesn't say that. Why would you assume that? <laughs> don't go there. It was probably other disciples. It was probably people who were like, we want to hear more Jesus. And they're like, hop in. I've got a boat. And they go after them. The storm arises. They say, okay, we're going back. We're done. <laughs> right here is the calm before the storm. And I want you to, to put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. You're in this boat with Jesus. Things have been going really well. The people love Jesus. They've been observing him do miracle after miracle after miracle. They're like his right-hand guys. How exciting. They have no idea what's coming. They are about to be blindsided by a terrifying trial. We'll talk more about the storm in a moment, but this was a deadly storm. It was a deadly storm, but right now, they have no idea. Absolutely clueless. And there is no indication that this is some chastisement for them, that he brings the storm as some punishment for them. I mean, it was Jesus' idea even to go across. It wasn't like they did something wrong. In fact, it was Jesus who initiated the trip. And I think one thing we can, we can observe and maybe apply to this from our own life as we face trials is it, they do come upon us suddenly. If you've ever been in the midst of a trial and you, you look back and you're like, things were so good a week ago and it just looked like everything was up and up and up and then I was just blindsided. But one comfort we should take in that is that Christ controls 
our trials. He, he controls the timing of them. He controls the circumstances of our trials. Jesus knew this storm was coming. He's God. And he brought them to it. And as we'll see, he brought them to it and through it for a reason. Why does God lead them into this trial? This trial in which he controls the circumstances. I think 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 gives us an answer about why he brings us through any trial. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That little statement, so that. Why do we, why do we rejoice even if we've been grieved by various trials? Because God's doing something through them. He brings us to the trial to do something. It is not random. It is not outside of his control. It is not a sign that he doesn't care. It's because he's working through it to test our faith because tested faith is more precious than gold. It's proven out. It's made stronger, more pure through the trials. It's a good thing. And I think at this point, the disciples, they, they trusted Jesus. Because if you're reading Mark up to this point, you're like, they're seeing him do miracles. There seems to be an indication that they know who he is, that he's God. But there were areas where their faith was not altogether pure. It needed to be tested. I think that's true for us too. God takes us through trialsome circumstances because he wants to show us the areas in our life in which we do not trust him completely. We may have saving faith, but our faith is not perfect. It needs to grow. It needs to be refined. And often when we face these trials, maybe you, you, you lose your job or you lose your, your, your money, your, your safety net financially, and you, you, you do spiral into despair. Do you fall into to, to anxiety? How will I ever, how, what will I ever do about this? It's, it's a test of your faith. Will it grow? Do you trust money or God more? You lose a loved one, someone who's been very, very close to you, someone who you have depended on. And we grieve. Yes, we grieve. It's right that we grieve and we lament. But do we find in these trials that often we find in these trials what we truly trust in? And God uses that to purify it because it's for our good. It's better that you trust in God than in these temporal things. When it's revealed that I was trusting in something other than God, it hurts, right? It hurts. But it's better that I trust in God. It's better that I go through that so that I will trust in him more because that is a more sure place to trust. All temporal circumstances will end. All of the things that we trust in temporally in this, in this life, they do come to an end. They're not reliable. God is the rock. He's the rock. He doesn't move. That's where you want both feet planted. And when it's revealed that you're standing on sand in some area of your life, you want to find out as soon as possible. And so we look at trials with joy. We rejoice in them. Even as we grieve, we rejoice in them because it tests out our faith. It proves it. It purifies it. So Christ controls the timing of your trials. He brings them about precisely when you need them. What a source of confidence to know that in the midst of a trial, isn't it? Why now? Why did this happen now? Everything was going so good. You can imagine the disciples thinking this. Why now? If God is sovereign, and he is, then he controls even the timing of your trials. And he, and he controls the precise trials which you face, tailor-made for your sanctification. That's how you can look on a trial with joy if you recognize that God is sovereign over it and he uses it. So we've got to learn to trust him at all times, even in the midst of trials, remembering that Christ controls the timing of your trials. But that's not all. We also need to remember that Christ cares for you in the midst of trials. This is point number two. Christ cares for you in the midst of your trials. 
It was 37 through 38. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? This great windstorm, even today, Galilean fishermen call these early evening easterly windstorms sharkia, which is an Arabic word for shark. That's how scary they are. It's like a shark. They can come out of nowhere and absolutely wipe you out. They're terrifying. There was one recorded, I think it was in the 90s, where they had 10-foot waves. 10-foot waves. The Sea of Galilee isn't that big. It's, it's, it's 13 miles long and 7 miles across. 10-foot waves. And this boat was small. You know, 26 and a half feet by 7 and a half. That's not a big boat. And that's why the water was already filling the boat, it says. They're sinking. And I want to point out something here. Sometimes we look at the disciples. The disciples do silly stuff throughout the Gospels, right? You're kind of like, oh, you guys. This is not them being goofballs. Many of the men in this boat were fishermen by trade. Them being afraid of this storm tells you this was not a small storm. I think that we can surmise that if Christ had not intervened, they very likely would have died. Their boat would have been sunk. And so sometimes you you read this parable and you say, oh yeah, you calm the storm. They were going to die. Put yourself in their shoes. It's not a small thing that they went through here. This is like a life-changing, wake up 10 years from now in a cold sweat, reliving it type of experience. It's not a small thing. And yet, in the midst of it, Jesus is asleep. It says at the beginning of verse 38, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. So he's, he's probably underneath that helmsman's platform, little cushion under there. He's probably wet too. It says that the water was already filling the boat. It's like, he is really sound asleep. And, and, and there's something to note about this too. Jesus was not pranking them. It's not like he's got one eye open, like waiting, like, oh, this is going to be good. Jesus was truly man. He got tired. He got hungry. He thirsted. And it's a good thing to remember in, in, in stories like this, he's really asleep. He's tired. And so he's under there, partially protected from the elements. And they woke him, and listen to what they say. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? What a loaded question. Do you not care that we're perishing? It's such an odd question because when you think about it, you, 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 you kind of detect the fear there. We're perishing. They're scared. But there's like an overtone of anger to it don't you care? Why would they be angry? It, in the parallel accounts, Matthew 8, 25 um, tells this story and it says, and when they went and they woke him, they, they have him saying different stuff or they record different things that they had said. Uh, they say, save us, Lord, we are perishing. In Luke's account, they woke him and they say, master, master, we are perishing. But Mark shows that, that anger and even an accusation. Do you not care? Why are they angry? They're angry not because they don't know that Jesus is powerful. It's not because they think he can't do anything about this. They're angry because they suspect, based on his track record of miracles, that he can do something about this and is not doing it. And the conclusion they draw from that evidence is, must be because he doesn't care. That is not the right conclusion. They had faith in his power, but not in his love for them. They had faith in his power, but not in his love for them. And my goodness, if this doesn't go to the heart of our own doubts that arise when we're in the midst of trial, doesn't it? It's not that we doubt that he can do something about it. It's that we wonder in those moments, does he care enough to do something about it? Does he care? Because really, the logic is quite simple. You can, if Christ can do something to deliver me from this, 
and is not doing it. Why is he not doing it? A, it's because he doesn't care. Or B, it's because he does care and he has a purpose for it. That's the right conclusion. That's the conclusion of faith. But it's wrong. This, you know, people will say things like, there are no bad questions, right? Do you not care is a bad question. That's a bad question. Does he not care? The son of man who took on flesh and humbled himself to become a man, does he not care? Does Jesus, who handpicked these disciples to be with them and to minister along them, does he not care for them? Does the Christ who would suffer and die for the sins of all who would believe in him, does he not care? Does Jesus who would then ascend to the right hand of the Father to intercede on our behalf, does he not care? Does Jesus who's coming back again to deliver us and to give us an inheritance greater than all the treasure of the world, does he not care? Does he not care? It's a bad question. He does care. He's proven it time and time again. It is, it is the most reasonable thing in the world to conclude that in the midst of my trial, though this is hard, though I'm suffering, the right answer can't be that he doesn't care. Why? Because I've seen that he cared. I've seen that he cared. I know it. It says in Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It is an argument from the greater to the lesser. If he gave the greatest sacrifice there was, the greatest demonstration of his love that there ever could possibly be, how could we ever doubt that he cares again? How will he not also graciously give us all things? And so when you face the storms of life, they do hurt. I know they hurt. But we can have faith if we remember that Christ, he controls the circumstances and he genuinely does care for us in the midst of the trials. But there's a third thing we need to remember so that we can have faith in the midst of trials and that is that Christ conducts you through the trial. He conducts you through the trial, and that's verses 39 through 41. I love this part. <laughs> and he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with a great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? John MacArthur, commenting on this passage, he said, Perhaps nowhere else in Scripture is the humanity of Christ more dramatically juxtaposed with his deity. It's, it's, it's a, like a comical scene, almost. How quickly Jesus goes from asleep to commanding the elements. It's like that. And so you can understand the disciples' reaction. They're like, who, who, what? Who is this? And, and, and as I noted earlier, you know, this time of year is an important, uh, as we remember the advent of Christ, we remember the incarnation. It, it is important that we recognize the, the full deity of Christ and his full humanity. I think sometimes we can shy away from the fact that Jesus was human. Sometimes we can be like, yeah, maybe he wasn't really sleeping or maybe he really didn't need to eat. He was. He was fully human. And I think it's worth remembering that you do no dishonor to Christ by observing that his humanity was a true humanity. And this is important because Christ's humanity, the fact that he truly was man, is a necessary part of his functioning as our substitute. Because mankind, we have, we have not one, but two major problems. <laughs> one problem we have is that we are guilty before a holy God. We have sinned against him. 
that sin needs to be paid for. Romans says that the wages of sin is death. That sin will be paid for either by our own eternal death in hell, or it can be paid for by Christ who died on the cross for all those who have put their faith in him. But there's a second problem. It's not just the guilt of sin because God's requirement of us isn't purely that we avoid doing a bad, bad things. It's that we be righteous, that we have a positive righteousness. And Jesus' humanity means that those 33 years he lived on this earth, he not only didn't sin once, he perfectly obeyed God in all things. He was perfectly righteous. And that's when we talk about being justified. Those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven for our sins. We are also justified, which is to say declared righteous. So that I'm not just back at zero before God. I've got a positive infinity righteous standing on the basis of nothing that I've done, but purely what Christ has done. And that's because he lived this per perfectly righteous life as a man. That's why he can be our substitute. It's also Christ's humanity, the basis for his sympathetic intercession. It talks about how Jesus went and sat down at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for us. He, he prays for us. And it says that we have a sympathetic high priest who has been tempted in all manner like us, but without sin. He knows firsthand what it is to sin because he lives truly as a man. These are important truths. So don't, don't downplay the humanity of Christ. Fully man, fully God. Thus ends our theology lesson. Just kidding. We're still in the Bible. Uh, so this amazing thing happens. A sleeping Savior awakes, and he commands the elements. This is crazy. You might think back to Old Testament passages where prophets, think of Elijah who prayed 40 days, 40 nights, and, and, and the, it, you know, it didn't rain, and then it did rain, right? You see these things where people prayed, and amazing things happen, or, or, or Moses parting the Red Sea, all these different things. But it's very clear that they're, it's God doing these things either as an answer to prayer or through these people. Nobody but Jesus actually has the gall to say, by my own authority, stop it, wind. You know why he can do that? Because he made the wind, and the wind knows its master. He made the seas, and they obey him. This is a powerful, powerful moment. It says, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Charles Spurgeon writing about this, said, there was no trace of storm another moment after he had been awakened. The most blustering of the conflicting winds slept like a babe in its mother's bosom. The waves were as marble. Instant peace. It's not like a, a storm that slowly calmed down. It was like, psh, like something, something happened. This is weird. This is a miracle. Everything was still except for the disciples. <laughs> What a whiplash these guys just went through, <laughs> thinking you're going to die, and then like, okay, things are fine, but then the guy who's in the boat with you, who just demonstrated he has power of the elements, turns and faces you. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. And he says to them, verse 40, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? The word here for fear is literally cowardly fear. It's, it's understandable that they were afraid that they were going to die, right? But he's saying it's not a justified fear. It's understandable. It's not justified. It's a cowardly fear. Why are you afraid? Why? Because their faith or their fear came from a lack of faith. They forgot who was in the boat with them, and they forgot that he cared. Forgot they had the power and the care to conduct them through the trial. And then this, this is so interesting, verse 41. And they were filled with a great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? 
filled with a great... So they were afraid at the start, oh, master, we're perishing. But now it says they're filled with a great fear. They're more scared. They're more scared. They just went from, we're about to die, to, oh dear, (laughs) I'm even more afraid. It literally says, and they feared a great fear. And they say to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Where did this fear come from? Perhaps, as this happened, their minds are flashing back to scenes and passages from the Old Testament. The crossing of the Red Sea. God parting the water, having power over the water. Perhaps they thought of Psalm 89.9. You rule the raging sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Or maybe Psalm 77.16. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. Or even Psalm 107, 29. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. God's in the boat with them. God is in the boat with them. Imagine you're in that scene. You could picture Peter taking Andrew and be like, you stand right here in front of me. <laughs> it's terrifying. It is. It's scary. Why? Why is it scary? But it's Jesus. It's God. It's God. It's God. If you pictured, if you went out swimming in the ocean and there's a little tiger shark swimming around your legs and you're like, oh dear, I'm going to get, I'm going to get nibbled by this shark. You're pretty scared. And then a great white shark comes along and eats that one. You're like, oh, good. (laughs) No, a greater power has showed up. Something bigger than the wind and the waves. Something bigger and scarier than death itself. The one who holds death in his hand. God's in the boat with them. It's scary. It's scary. I mentioned earlier the the Gerizim's demoniac. So if you you keep reading through chapter 5, they they do get across to the other side of the water, and they land in this country, the Gerizim's, and there's this guy there who has been running around through the tombs naked, and they keep trying to put chains on him, the people who live there and trying to tie him up, but he keeps breaking them because he's possessed by a bunch of demons. And so Jesus shows up to the region, and he casts out the demons. And this is the scene where he says, you know, the, the demons say, I'm, I'm legion. And he casts them out into the pigs, and the pigs go, wee, 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 all the way off the cliff. <laughs> Poor pigs. But what always bugged me about that story was how the people who lived in that country reacted. They didn't come to Jesus and they're like, oh, thank you, thank you. This guy, he was, he was causing such a ruckus. He was, he was breaking stuff. We had to keep the kids away because he was running around naked. You know, we, we had all these, we went through so many handcuffs because we kept trying to chain him up and he'd break them. Our handcuff budget is like through the roof. We're way in the red. They didn't thank him. You, know, you remember what they said? They begged him to leave. That's their first reaction. Why? Same thing like the shark. They were scared of this, this demon-possessed guy Because he was powerful, but then a greater power showed up, and so they feared a great fear. What are we to take from this? I think one thing is if you picture the disciples, something is shifting in their minds concerning the workings of the universe. The the orders of their fears are rearranging. And I think so often we have wrongly ordered fears. We, there are scary things, but there are things that are scarier. And often we forget that the Jesus who does care also does have all the power. He also is fearsome. And that's fearful until you are on the side of Jesus. When, when you know him, And you know that that power is on your side, that he he cares for you, that he is using that power for you, to grow you, to build you up, to help conduct you even through hard trials. He's not just in the boat with you, actually. Sometimes you think you go through, I wish I was like the disciples. They were with Jesus. They could see him face to face. That was so much better. If I, if I I could just look at Jesus, then I'd be reassured. 
Jesus himself said, actually, no, you guys have it better. In John 16, 7, he's telling the disciples, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, that's referring to the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. He's saying it's better. It's better. Us who are believers on the other side of Pentecost, who have the indwelling Holy Spirit, God is in you, not just with you. He says further down in John 16, in, chapter, or in verse 33, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I love that verse. What a comfort that is. You're gonna, you, you can have peace if you have peace with God. Even in the midst of the harshest trials, the biggest tribulations. Because he's overcome the world and greater is he that is in you. And the amazing thing about that is fear, even of deadly peril, suddenly stops making sense when we really believe that. Like, that's the craziest thing in the world. How, how could you be more afraid of something than death? But the disciples facing certain death were suddenly more afraid of something than death. And I think this is why sometimes we struggle to understand how a martyr could willingly walk into a hostile country or joyfully to the gallows of persecution. It's properly ordered fears. It's, it's faith. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He said, don't fear death. Fear me. Fear me. Death shouldn't terrify you because it's painful, but because what comes after it. And this is something I would say to those of you, if you, if you do not know Christ, if you have not repented of your sin and put your faith in him, these promises of the comfort, of the peace that can attend trials, of the fact that God's using trials to grow you and for your good, they don't belong to you if you're not a Christian. They don't belong to you. And, and, and on the other side of death, what awaits you is much scarier than the pain of death. It's, it says in Hebrews 10, 27, a fearful expectation of judgment. You're going to meet this Christ. But the difference about whether that is going to be a happy, joyful occasion or one that is filled with terror is whether or not you have trusted in him in this life. I would beg you, don't wait another day. Don't wait another day. This Jesus stands ready to forgive you to cleanse you from your sins, to lift that burden of guilt that you carry around all the time, all those past regrets, all that sense of knowing that you have done wrong. It can be forgiven in Christ. And more so, you can be declared righteous. You can have a right standing before God. And you can have the hope of eternal life with him, adoption as his son or his daughter. It's the good news of the gospel. And even in this life, it doesn't mean that, that things just turn around and you stop having problems because you've become a Christian. It means that you understand that now the problems have a purpose, that God is using them to grow your faith, using them to refine you, using them ultimately for your good and for his glory. And in that, we rejoice. You know, early Christians actually depicted the church as a boat, one of these fishermen boats, like the one that had been dug up there on the edge of Galilee. And they depicted the church as that, in the midst of a tumultuous sea. But Jesus would be in the midst of the boat. And so there was nothing to fear. I love that. I love that. Because even in the fiercest 
storm of life. Christ is with you in the boat, turning trials into treasure, the treasure of precious, refined faith. We want that. It's not easy, I know, but we can trust him in the midst of trials. If you remember those three things, Christ controls the timing of your trials, Christ cares for you in the midst of your trial, and Christ conducts you through the trials. 